My name is Luis Gardena Costa. Well, my first effort uh, as the founder of the organization was to bring people together. And uh, I felt that if I could not express well what my vision was and if it could not be understood and accepted and become the vision of the development team, the people that I would call co-founders, uh, then we couldn't really develop a mass movement for peace and justice in this community. So my first effort was to really try to change the mindset of the leading activists in this community. That it isn't about a focus in a particular category of life. That it is about the whole of existence. That it is about a holistic approach now. In 1980, 81, when I was talking about it, um, because we founded it at Puente in 1982, holism was akin to brown rice and shiatsu. You know, that's how people saw holism. And one of our first taglines, of course, was um, a center for growth and empowerment. And the word empowerment was wildly militant <laughs> because it had to do with the struggle of mostly black people that coined the phrase here in Bedford-Stuyvesant, rising up and demanding their rights, their civil and human rights. So just in our byline, so to speak, um, people felt, well, that's a little bit radical, a center for growth and empowerment. Now, of course, we would laugh at that today, right? But, uh, you know, those, those were funny days. Um, but we stuck to our guns and we really accepted and understood that what the government had done to pacify us, to turn the clock, to deviate us from a focus of community action, was to create pacification hamlets, was to focus the situation, the social situation on individuals, as if it was about problems of individuals who needed help. And instead of community action, the government would substitute referrals to particular clinical services so as to basically blame the individuals for their own problem. Um, and the sacred mantra of the social work institutions in those moments was uh, dysfunction. Um, so the individual was dysfunctional, the family was dysfunctional, and as a result, the community was dysfunctional. Nobody blamed the government. Nobody blamed the policymakers that created the context for this kind of oppression. It was about dysfunction. We turned that around. We broke with the social service mantra. We said, no, we don't believe in the social service model. And of course, everyone goes, oh my God, what do you mean you don't believe in social services? You don't want to become a social service center? You need social services, you need food stamps, you need help, you know, all kinds of stuff. You people are the poorest people in the city of New York. What's wrong with you, you know? And I said, no, what we need is development. What we have to focus is on creating community, promoting love and caring, mastery, peace and justice. If we do that, we can, we can then solve our problems. In the Upper East Side, uh, among the richest people in the world, nobody, approaches anyone else on the basis of their dysfunction. Nobody creates a community center for problems. <laughs> no, if they have a problem, they'll deal with it, but no, their, their community centers or institutions, cultural and otherwise, are for their development, for their children's development. So why would we approach one class of people one way? and another class of people another way. We are deserving of human development, of community development, and we can lead that. And I believed that that was the only way that we were going to achieve it. You know, we have an apartheid system of education in New York and in the country. There is one kind of education experience if you're black or brown or mostly poor white. And there's another ex experience if you're upper middle class and white. It's the private school and the public school. 
And we have an obligation to make the public school just as good, if not better, than the private school experience. Because if we have public schools at all, it's really to create community. It's really to, to understand and promote and expand our democracy. So if we don't really work hard in terms of making public schools the epitome of education in this country, then we fail our democracy and we fail our nation. You know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. And given the fact that we have this apartheid system, given the fact that most of people of color are in the public school system, uh, it doesn't make any sense not to have teachers, administrators, leaders of that system that reflect the body, that come from that body. Anything else is a sort of weird paternalism that really uh, has no place in our democracy. We're about, or should be about, empowering each individual. And what does that say about public education if you don't see uh, in the teachers and in the administrators the faces of the very people they teach? I remember uh, someone told me that they, a person came from South Africa and was introduced to the criminal justice system, went to the courts, and just naturally said, gee, I didn't know you had apartheid here. Because he saw that the jailers were white, the, especially in that time, which was like 15 years ago, the jailers were white, the judges were white, the prosecutors were white, and the lawyers were white. But the defendants were black and brown. That has no place in our democracy. That's really uh, Jim Crow of another name. Uh, it's really the kind of segregation that should be um, something that all of us should rail against. Um, it is a continuation of America's mortal sin of slavery. And we have to do everything to defeat that and to create the kind of integrated society where everyone feels empowered to grow and share and move this country forward. Porque la justicia importa. Because justice matters. Because justice matters. Because justice matters. Because justice matters. Because justice matters.